Thank you to everyone joining us from across the country and around the world this morning. Uh, I'm Michael Higgs, Virtual Programs Manager here at Conscious Capitalism. Uh, on behalf of the CCI team, we appreciate you taking time to learn and grow in community with us. Uh, today, we're excited to be sharing space, space excuse me, with uh, Lindsay uh, Harl Kadatz, owner of BRP Consulting, and Stefan Herbst. He's the general manager at Advantus 360 to discuss changing the brain of business, value center behavior transformation. As many of you know, conscious capitalism is a philosophy that emphasizes the human nature of business, as, um, as well as a movement as business leaders around the world working to change the practice and purpose of capitalism as a means to elevate humanity. Conscious Capitalism, Inc. is, an incorp is a nonprofit organization dedicated to catalyzing that movement by creating learning opportunities like today's session and building systems of support for practicing conscious capitalists through our senior leader network membership and engagement with our local chapters. Several times a month, CCI offers virtual gatherings like this as a way for the community to see how this philosophy takes shape in the leadership journeys and the business practices of those in our network. A little info about today's uh, gathering. It's gonna run for about 45 minutes. Uh, Lindsay's gonna share a presentation uh, and then she and Stefan will be in conversation for about 20, five to 30 minutes, then we'll transition to audience questions during the last 10 to 15 minutes of our time together. Uh, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen um, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can during our time together. If you experience any technical issues, um, please email us at info at consciouscapitalism.org um, and we will uh, promptly take care of those for you. Thank you. Um, I am now excited to introduce you to Lindsay Harl Kadatz. Uh, she's known in speaking circles as the values vixen, uh, that, and a quirky human. As a speaker, brand, and mindset consultant, she supports leaders who have an immediate and lasting impact on their people, and it starts with values. She, she speaks on a number of topics, including mental health and the creative brain, what values in action do for trust and how listening is more than ensuring you've had a good Q-tip cleaning. Um, each time uh, she looks to leave value through tangible takeaways while connecting with a bit of humor here and a well-timed pun here and there. A neurochange method master, certified practitioner, branding specialist, and ever learning listening student facilitator, she uses a different lens for connecting leaders and teams to their values, their values to their behavior, and their behavior to actions that matter to gain real traction in business and life. Stefan Herbst is general manager at Advantis 360. Stefan collaboratively, collaboratively leads uh, the team there to provide applied assistance throughout the organization. His entrepreneurial spirit and vision support the business functions, assisting the organization in maintaining quality relationships with clients, motivating and mentoring staff through empowerment and thoughtful leadership, continual improvement, and ensuring sustainability to achieve business objectives. With more than 15 years of experience in IT and strategy, Stefan effectively utilizes his expertise to stand behind the team to support leading IT professional services. Prior to his role at Advantis 360, Stefan spent several years in security operations and architectural roles before migrating to leading his own practice for a variety of clients throughout North America. Lindsay, good morning. Michael, and, good morning. <laughs> uh, I hand it to you for your presentation. Thanks for Wonderful. being Wonderful. Sorry? I said, thank you for being with us this morning. I'm so gosh darn happy to be here. And what we're experiencing right now is the disconnect between Teams and Zoom. So our dear Stefan will be with us shortly. Um, but that's what happens in the IT world. Is that not true? So I'm here to start. And as I said, super excited to be here. And over the next 20 to 25 minutes, we are going to be diving into some super fun topics all about workplace culture change. And we're gonna be discussing, well, what is a workplace culture change dilemma? 
The need to consider individuals when we are considering a culture change. How to, um, we're gonna be learning a little bit more about a face approach to changing the business brain. Uh, how to actually reframe, we re rewire and renew the business brain. And then if all goes well with Zoom, we're going to be hearing from my wonderful client, Stefan Herbst, about how this neuro-based approach is currently supporting them in this ever-evolving era of business. Now, as we go through this lovely little presentation, I would love for you to keep some thoughts in mind. Thoughts in mind. That's right. Um, and the first one is really that a business is a person. It is an entity at your boardroom table. It has a body, it has a brain, it has a belief system, all of those things that we humans also have. The next thing to keep in mind then is that all businesses have people in them who are making up these aspects of the business uh, body, the business person, the business as an entity. Therefore, the business itself will absolutely be influenced by each and every individual within that system. And for a business to evolve in this era, so must our people. And it's not just about evolving the processes, the operations, or the brand. It's about going inward and looking at the who is actually in this business, supporting this business entity. And for sustained evolution of our business, our people have to care. Because people who are invested um, in what they're doing, they have more to lose. And therefore, we must connect to why they're in their, in your business in the first place. So why, though, does this actually matter when it comes to changing workplace culture and business operations? Well, a, a huge one, really, is that according to a study done by Forbes, companies with strong cultures experience four times revenue growth compared to competitors with weak or undefined cultures. And even more, in a 2019 Glassdoor study, um, this study placed culture, values, and senior leadership as the key elements for employee satisfaction. <laughs> satisfaction. And even more interestingly is that 50% lower than those three things were compensation and benefits. So we really need to look at the who, because throwing money at people now is not what's going to keep them there. It's not what's going to make strong cultures. It's the individuals. Which brings us to this idea of a workplace culture dilemma. So over the years, I've had many companies ask me to do both a brand refresh and a rebrand. And so what this often means is that we're now redefining values, mission, key messages, our unique value purpose uh, proposition. However, in another study done by Speak App, over a thousand participants, part partici participants participated, say that 10 times fast, please. And what was found in this study is that respect and fairness, trust and integrity, and teamwork are the three most important attributes of a culture, of a strong culture. And those are in 39%, 23%, and 9% respectively. Well, these three things are values. And if these values are not demonstrated, then we're actually ignoring key pieces of what makes a strong culture and reducing the revenue that we could be bringing in. So when I'm asked this question to do a rebrand or a refresh, first thing I ask is, well, why? Why are we doing this? What is, is, is motivating you to come and have this conversation? And the conversation is very rarely about a brand. It is more about, there's alignment in their, mis, in their culture. There's a misalignment in their culture. And there's huge gaps between the culture that they want to have and the culture that actually is. So, if it, it wasn't so much that these individuals needed a brand refresh, rather it was what they wanted their current brand to be. And culture ultimately is demonstrated in our actions. And because our brand is really our business DNA of our business entity, the culture is the expression of that DNA. 
So if there's misalignment, there's broken trust. And so we have to then look at what behaviors were be, um, are being tolerated in the business, are being promoted or even unintentionally championed by the leadership team. <clears throat> Pardon me. Because ultimately a brand refresh is often just a band-aid to a deeper misalignment in culture. And so what is interesting here is that for this brand refresh or a cultural realignment or alignment to really happen then take hold and have life breathed into it, there needs to be consistent behavior reinforcement for culture to actually change. Because just because we roll out a new brand does not mean this culture will change. Just because we remove a quote unquote toxic person does not mean that that toxic behavior has been removed for it was once tolerated. And unless we, um, unless we intentionally rewire a team's collective being, their beliefs and their behaviors, we will eventually uh, see this toxic trait happen again. The next thing that needs to happen again is that people, again, have to care about what they are building. So we must include our people in these conversations about what this new culture is going to look like, what it's going to sound like, what it's going to feel like going forward. What would really inspire our people to work and build a strong, impactful culture? And from there, for all of these things to really take hold, people have to begin to rewire their brains to understand and align with the actions that are now going to be required to live the brand within that culture because they understand what the company's values look like in action. And my definition of values is that our values are our underlying beliefs upon which we take action. So everything all, always comes back to action. And this then all points to the individuals who are in the business itself. And since people are individuals with individual thoughts and needs, which are individual brain patterns, we need to understand what motivates their self, which then brings us to the individual self-determining nature. And this is all around the theory of self-determination, which has three basic psychological needs for well-being. And the first is for us to really feel like we have um, control over ourselves, we need to have autonomy. So we have to have ownership over our own choices, our behaviors, our actions. When we're working on our own, we know we have choice over what we are doing. And really just being told what behaviors we now have to do will not empower ownership or accountability in any way. Um, so the leadership desired culture behaviors will often be ignored. The second psychological need then for this well-being is competency. So feeling that we are in control of our own growth in our own actions, that we have, are, are competent in what we are doing. This includes how we are acting. Being told um, that this is now how we do things without any inclusion um, of the self again, is another way to have resistance to impl implementing this desired workplace culture behavior because it may not be what I'm competent in. And if I'm not feeling competent or have any say in why we're doing this, myself is going to push back. And then thirdly, we have to have a sense of relatedness for, to meet these psychological needs. We have to have a purpose together because ultimately humans are wired for connection. We are born into community, and that is where we thrive. So if we don't have this sense of belonging, um, the team itself will be operating in different directions. If we don't understand where we're going together, how, how can a culture be consistent in moving forward in a healthy manner? And what this really looks at then is we have to go to the micro aspect of the business. So the individuals, those little cells within the business entity outward to the macro, which is the group. And that then helps us achieve, achieve our outcomes greater. Now, what this all comes to is that if we want a different future for our business, and this is often why people come saying we want a brand refresh or there's something not working in here. 
you know that the path that you're on is not the path that you're going to succeed on. So you want a different future for your business, but you're going to need different human behaviors, not just different, different processes or systems. You need to go right to the behaviors. And this comes down to understanding that how a company currently acts is based on a very certain set of behaviors, which is in influenced again by those values. So what we must look at to get the future that we want is understanding what beliefs and what values and what purpose and what behaviors we currently have. Because we can't change when we don't know what we need to change. And this changed behavior all comes down to rewriting both the individual and the collective brain. And this is all based on the neural change method approach to changing the brain of a business. And so let's think way back to that second slide where we identified that the business is an entity in and of itself. And this business then, the business brain, is a collection of minds within the organization. Minds that we must align while also giving them the space to thrive individually. This means that we need to understand how this collective mind is currently wired. And then when we understand that, we can begin to understand how and where we need to rewire it. And so this can be done through four lovely phases with the first one being identify where we're actually at. So what is that current purpose that we have as a collective? How do people understand it and are they connected to it? And how are they acting in alignment with it or not? And from there, we're able to start to recognize what beliefs our people have and how these either add to or take away from the intentional culture that we're looking to build. And we're gonna be discussing that this piece a little bit more on the next slide. But first, the second phase is that we, once we know where we are, we get to define the future where we're at um, and understand what is currently keeping us from moving towards that future. Um, and this is really where we start to identify what are those mindsets? What are those attitudes about our, uh, that our people have? So for instance, do they actually believe that our company can change and are open to this? Or do they believe that this is how things have always been done? There's no point in changing them. It, we've, tried, we've tried things like this before. And so they're really just closed off to change. Now that's not impossible, but it's a different hurdle to start from. And this all gives us a beautiful starting point for what beliefs we now need to rewrite. And in order um, it, within this all, we get to identify what behaviors we are doing that we want to continue to do, that we need to stop doing, and what behaviors we need to start doing. From there, we then get to close that gap. So we get to understand where are we? Where do we want to be? How do we close this gap? And what's so important here is that we need to really connect with the emotions of our people and what they are feeling because change is happening and change, even change for the better is hard and it's scary and it's unknown. And so we need to make space for people to feel their way forward. So they're more likely to then reinforce any beliefs that need to be revised and be open to this belief revision. And then they can continue to build intentional behaviors that reflect the desired workplace culture. And I mean, we're asking people to change their previous belief system about the workplace culture. And it takes time and consistency and continual reinforcement. And even more, this all speaks to an emotional intelligence. And when we learn how to unlock our own emotional intelligence, we untap our real potential. Um, and so interesting is that Emotional intelligence and leadership in the workplace has been studying has been studied more and more and more. And in a recent study conducted by the Energy Product and uh, Pro Project, pardon me, and Harvard Business Review, it indicates that employees who feel that their leaders are treating them with more respect and empathy are 63% more satisfied with their jobs, 55% more engaged. 58% more focused and 110% more likely to stay within the organization. 110% more likely to stay within an organization. That right there goes straight to our bottom line. And 
even more so, it goes straight to our word of mouth and our reputation because we have long term employees who want to be there and are excited about being there. And then finally, we're able to really reinforce what this desired future is because we're now able to understand where we are, what we need to close, and how we can create a clear plan for how to work together for the beliefs and the values that will thrive in this new workplace culture, for what to do in the face of challenges, because challenges will always happen, for what behaviors and attitudes we will not tolerate anymore. Um, and this is especially important within the leadership because they are the models for the rest of the company. So if even one leader is stepping out of line, everything else, all this change is for nothing. And then from there, we can set up this environment to reinforce the behaviors and the new ways of, of doing things. Because ultimately, culture change is about connecting our minds, those beliefs, those values, those emotions, with our brain, uh, which are our behaviors, our habits, our thought patterns, strengthening new neural pathways and weakening old habits out of our systems. And so, do do, there we go. What this is coming down to, and we're gonna be breaking out that identify piece a little bit more in this slide, is all about how do we now reframe, how do we now rewire, and then how do we renew the culture brain of our business. And so from phase one, we were able to identify that we are able to clarify, uh, gain clarity, pardon me, on what beliefs are underlying people's actions, both individually and as a collective. And it's here that we see what beliefs are misaligned with the values that we purport to have. Um, and so we, so what is so important here is that no matter what values are updated, what key messages are created, what empowering words and speeches are given based on this new brand, they're not going to stick unless we up show up in our behaviors. And our behaviors are influenced by our values. And our values are our underlying beliefs upon which we take action. So an aligned culture and a brand will not happen if we're not able to understand and start to rewire what these beliefs are that may be getting in the way. So almost always in a brand refresh or even a, a culture update, we look to update these values and understand what are our values today? Because aspirational values are great, but we need to operate from where we're operating from in order to move closer towards these aspirational values. And I want to give a little example here of a value that I'm hearing more and more from companies. And that value is care, caring. And a quick definition is we are a company of individuals who care about our clients, who care about our work. Now, first, this, again, a value is that underlying belief upon which we take aligned action. So if we don't have the right beliefs with this stated value as it is stated, the value is moot. And therefore, all behaviors and subsequent actions after that are also mute, moot, pardon me. So if this is a value that you are purporting to have, but the actions of your people, including your leadership, are not reflecting this, it's not a problem with the value other than it's not true. It's more that your people may be operating on beliefs such as, I work for the paycheck, not for the feelings. It's not my problem. I did my part, so these issues aren't mine. Customers are so annoying. I, if I understand it. Why can't they? Well, if those are the underlying behaviors supporting this care value, is that care really true? So we must address those underlying beliefs before we can even begin to have people begin to rewrite them or further help them self-select out of the company if they do, if they're not open to revising it because they are not wrong in their beliefs. They're now just really not a right fit for the company. And this comes down to that belief revision, which is the process. And it is a process of changing our beliefs. And how do we do this then is that we have to have the individual have a willingness um, to find and process and internalize their own current beliefs that are against what this value means and how they can perhaps rewrite it 
um, should they be open to? And that is important. We also then need to really show what this belief in action looks like. And we need to make it tangible because words on a page are great. Giving them in an onboarding document, having them plastered on the walls, great. But unless we understand what they are in a tangible fashion, it's so hard to really understand and take ownership over them and then put them into our role. Which is where we need to then take very incremental shifts in rewriting these beliefs for ourselves because our brains try to maintain logic in what is happening around us and why. And if we're not able to maintain that logic, we become overwhelmed, which may cause us to then just revert back to beliefs and behaviors because that's what we're comfortable with. We simply cannot ask people to change overnight, really because our brains literally do not work this way. So when we take these tiny, teeny, wonderful little uh, changes over time, then these beliefs are more likely to become per uh, permanent and persistent throughout the organization. Therefore, the value is more likely to become permanent and persistent. Therefore, the behaviors are more likely to become permanent and persistent. And what is important to note is that we're not looking for perfection over time. We are looking for progress over time. And so to re revisit the exercise of how is this belief um, rewriting going, we need to look at a, a minimum of every 30 days. And we then get to celebrate the progress that we're seeing along the way and knowing that it's really not an end goal, that it's a progress focus and we get to see the gain and we're not so focused on how far we have to go. And in all of that, you know, once we've identified, clearly identified what the beliefs are currently operating within our business, we can then begin to shift them if needed. We can then begin to reinforce them in behaviors uh, that we're looking for, which is ultimately our brand in action. And then we get to more easily close that gap from where we current are, currently are to where we currently need to be, a part of me, to where we desire to be. And then, you know, the ultimate goal for changing the brain of the business, yes, ultimately, you know, if we look at that four times gro revenue growth, that is a huge goal. However, the ultimate goal of really focusing on changing the brain of the business is to have this intentional behavior transformation for desired and sustainable workplace culture evolution via people's self-determination. Because when people have this self-determination met within a collective group of people, we are then able to drive in the same direction while feeling individually fulfilled while supporting a larger purpose. And this is because we are able to have that individual accountability and that personal control, which supports our need for autonomy. We're able to have that greater clarity in our actions and our roles, which highlights our competency and same with an increase in our confidence in both our actions and our outcomes. Again, speaking to our competency. And then we are more likely to feel much more connected to this purpose that we have and have a, have a much deeper trust in both ourselves and in others on our team, which meets that relatedness need. So that's really all I'm going to talk about today, but I do, well, until we bring on the wonderful Stefan, who is here, I am told, huzzah. Uh, but what we covered, because it was a fairly quick overarching uh, conversation, is that you know we covered why we should really include this individual to solving uh, a bigger workplace culture dilemma and that was through the self-determination theory uh, we went and started to dive into how the current business brain functions in relation to our behavior and that was through our neural change and then we also talked about how do we can begin to intentionally build a workplace culture using our uh, defined behavior change. And that was all about belief and behavior revision for this new desired culture. And before, before Stefan, before you talk, I just have one little question that, you know, if, any, if, if you leave with anything today, um, if you're thinking about a rebrand for your company or even looking to improve the behaviors of your people, 
first ask yourself, how is your workplace culture currently aligned with how your people behave today? And that'll give you that beautiful starting place. So now, welcome, Stefan. I'll, I'll give I'll, Stefan and I. <laughs> hi, Stefan. <laughs> Stefan is a client hi, of Lindsay. mine. I adore him. He's very grace, graciously agreed to come and just share a little bit about of the experience that we worked together on. I'm going to put on the screen what we did, but Stefan is going to speak to that um, because he's amazing and wonderful. So Stefan, take it away. No problem. Um, I just want to make sure you can hear me, Lindsay. You can see me. That's Everything. all working. Awesome. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Well, first off, uh, I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it's great to take the opportunity to tell a great story. I always love to do that. I did make things a little bit more exciting this morning than I needed to because I was a bit late uh, joining and no one's ever had any technical problems, I know, so you, you won't know at all what I'm talking about. But just to, to open up a little bit about myself uh, and, the, and the organization that uh, I'm grateful uh, to be a part of, um, and then I'll, I'll go in to give you my take as someone who walked the walk of, of uh, what Lindsay went through uh, presenting earlier. So um, I co-founded Advantis 360. Uh, I currently act as the general manager. We are uh, based in Western Canada. You know, if that window wasn't frosted, you would see that it's actually snowing today. It's, it's trying to be spring, um, but I think it could try a little bit harder. Um, and really, we, um, we, we came to the market serving some cybersecurity solutions needs, and we came to the market very specifically uh, when I founded uh, the company with uh, uh, partners and some, uh, some uh, key individuals who started taking and solving one need, and our, our go-to-market was simple. We know people need this one thing. We need to deliver it in an exceptional way all the time, no matter what. And when we didn't hit the mark, we would do what we needed to, to, to get there in the end. And our customers really valued that. Uh, it built a great sense of team. It allowed us to grow uh, organically to a team of 10, just uh, doing more of this type of activity. And we were left at that point pondering um, a bit of a brand refresh, a bit of a alignment to support uh, some accelerated growth. And I personally sat uh, at this juncture thinking and sort of feeling there was two paths. There, there was the um, original path, or I would call it the standard path, uh, that wasn't too different when we founded the company, which is you're an entrepreneur, you're bootstrapping a business, you're doing a million things with not enough time. And they all feel critical. And you know, you know, logos and, and branding and imaging and customer uh, interactions and, and uh, attracting people and, and aligning them on your team and working with them, it, it, it's an extreme undertaking. And I felt like the standard path is to sort of do things in a, in a quick expedited fashion where if I'm an organization looking at sharpening our image, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to see what our customers want. I'm gonna look over at my competition and see what they're doing, and maybe find some points of resonation and let's get it done. Let's get it uh, produced. Let's let's put it on. Uh, let's publish it and let's take it to market and let's also uh, market it internally. And that felt like we were missing out on something, taking that approach, or I call it that standard approach. And one parallel I felt being in uh, a technology industry is this term of shadow IT. So if people haven't heard of this term, this is basically uh, when an IT department says, we don't support Dropbox in our enterprise today. And then 30% of the people have just used Dropbox because they need that functionality in their business. And this, uh, this, uh, this reality, which is, is very common, uh, it's been labeled shadow IT. And I felt we had, we had shadow marketing and shadow branding going on. We had, uh, luckily, we had fantastic people, uh, which I'm very grateful for. So this shadow branding and marketing and interaction was actually quite positive. 
Um, but it was happening just because we hadn't distilled a new version and presented it and, uh, and thrown it out there. Uh, didn't mean it was already happening. So this, this led the path to fork, you know, the second fork in the road, the better path. And I remember reaching out, uh, trying to find an option, uh, just, you know, as an entrepreneur with not enough time in the day. And I was using things like, let's focus on content, not distribution. Let's focus on the message. Um, and I didn't really know what I was exactly looking for. And gratefully, very gratefully, I was introduced to Lindsay. And she said, yeah, this could be great. Let's, uh, let's get started. And I had no idea about some of the other aspects that she's talking about. I'm, I'm coming at it from someone trying to run a business and uh, support my team and support my customers. Um, we went down path to much of the stuff Lindsay has on the screen now that she's talked about, we felt as an organization. Um, you know, when I look back and I think about what were uh, amazing impacts on taking that uh, non-standard path of, of brand awareness, branding, uh, you know, redefinition, uh, team alignment, really we had capitalized on a bunch of amazing perspectives and amazing uh, team members' uh, insights that we were able to pull together. Through that exercise, we virtually had no effort to train or, uh, or instill our campaign into our internal people because it, it happened organically uh, through this process. And because we, we experienced that approach as people, and we went through the, the brand values and action exercise, it's ingrained in how we behave, it's ingrained in how we respond to challenges. Like Lindsay said, those challenges present themselves every single day. Sometimes they're small, sometimes they're very, very uh, large or, um, or daunting. And we find ourselves going through the discussion as, a, as an actual tool um, to help navigate these uh, challenges as a group, as a team. So I think, you know, looking back, um, it's, it's exactly what we wanted. We got so much more out of it. It wasn't uh, producing something and then making sure everyone was trained on it. It was involved. And I think uh, some of the aspects that I can just see, because I don't understand uh, the science of it, I can say people responded, people felt purposeful, and you know what? I think as a small business owner, um, accountability is absolutely essential to survive. And I think larger organizations can, can get away where some individuals come every day and they don't uh, bring a, a full set of accountability. But I would, I would argue to those organizations that you are missing out on potential, um, really. So in wrapping up, I would say this uh, is an amazing experience. If you are an entrepreneur, if you are a small team, if you need to do more with less, this approach just makes a lot of sense and it's results driven. And I would argue, although it's not, uh, it's not the environment we're in, if you're in a larger organization, I really do think this is just an avenue to tap more potential, more potential. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I'll, I want to just wrap up and say, if anyone wants to reach out, uh, probably the best way to connect with me personally is on LinkedIn. Um, thank you very much for, uh, allowing me to share our story and, uh, have me join the discussion today, Lindsay and Michael. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stefan. And, uh, gosh, the, 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 sh the notion of the shadow IT, um, I sort of hope um, the modern Jungian psychologists will run with that notion because I think the shadow shows up in many ways in uh, in yeah. organizations today. But uh, but but thank you for that that description and how it presented itself within your organization. Um, Absolutely, Michael. I do I do want to save uh, some time for Q and A. Um, I also want to be respectful both to our audience and our guests um, for the very compelling conversation. Um, that they've offered to us today. 
Uh, we may go slightly over just to give our guests, because uh, I do, I really do want to jump into some of these questions. These are some great questions that have shown up in our Q and A queue. Um, so, to dovetail on one of your closing comments, Stefan, um, around this being applied in in organizations of various size, uh, Phil had a question. Um, you know, he said this is really a question of scale and direction. Um, when we talk about changing for a group of 30, is it a different game than changing for 30,000? And what approach might you take? Do you take a top down and sort of cascade through the organization? Do you start at the bottom up? Do you perhaps find a business unit to sort of embed this concept in and grow from there? I, I would, Lindsay, I would love to hear your reflection um, to Phil's question. Mm hmm. I, absolutely is different. You always have to take a different approach, even if the companies are the same size, it, they're still made up of individuals. So it's what is the best approach for this company? I, I come from a very large multinational accounting firm from my corporate career. And there were absolutely differences between the teams and how we operated in the values. So if we're looking to do a full rebrand, I mean, that comes back to the board. What is this board? Why are we wanting this? How is this going to be impacting our numbers? What is the reason that we're now needing to do this? Understanding that is so important. From there, it's then, well, who in the company is operating well? Mm -hmm. What are the teams that are really thriving? And let's look at them and understand why and start growing from there. And then we can understand how do we bring in other people? How do we bring in you know, the bottom up, the, the top mm -hmm. down and bring us all together? Because in, in, in big organizations, you know, often it's that middle level manager that's the holdup. And so how do we encourage them to not be that bottleneck in not bring not not doing the behaviors that were now being required and so this often comes down to either team halls team halls town halls pardon me active team halls where we all why am i saying town halls golly gosh where we all come together in this huge room and break apart into different groups and have different levels talking to one another and going through a, a, a sort of question of you know, who are we? Who do we want to be? What do we see our vision as? And through these conversations, that's where we tend to start to see consistencies from those who are on the high, high, high to those who are, and I don't on the low, 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 but really mm -hmm. we're all the same because we all have to be supportive of the company. Uh, we're all representatives of the company. And so we are either the biggest cheerleaders or their worst nightmare. And when you get everybody at a table and break down those barriers as to who can talk to who, you start to get an, a sense of what is the real personality of this business? Where are those gaps? And then your leadership team gets to see and hear what are your people actually saying? What's going to motivate them? Mm -hmm. are they, do they even have clarity on what it is that we're doing? Because often that clarity can get lost down the line as to why we're doing something. So that, that's absolutely the first thing I would say is when we're looking at huge 30K companies, look for the teams who are thriving because mm. there almost always is at least one. Mm. And what about that team? Is it the leader? Is it that they all understand their purpose? Is that they're operating in kindness? Is it that... You know, they're just really brilliant people, but typically those teams that are working the best together have a leader who is that empathetic leader who listens, who asks the questions, who teases the answers out of their team mm. and make them feel like they have a real purpose in their actions. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Tiana, and apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name, but uh, I, I love this question. What have you seen as triggers companies to shift into realizing that they need a brand refresh beyond? Let me let me let me start this one over. Um, uh, what have you seen triggers companies to shift into realizing 
that they need a brand refresh beyond what happens in marketing to fundamental behavior changes within the company. Mm -hmm. So what is that trigger point? Maybe that lead domino. Well, it's a simple question really of what is not going to make this happen? Like, what do you want to see happen? What will get in the way? What's your blind spot here? Mm -hmm. And it's just listening and then asking question back. And then part of the reason, you know, when I started uh, my own company in 2011, it started as a copywriting business. Why it switched, uh, moved over into brand branding and now brand and culture consulting was because I would ask these questions as to, well, why are we doing this? Why are we writing this? They, and it came down to, well, I don't really know who I am. We just need to figure out our voice. We can do that in a couple of blogs. And I'm like, oh goodness, my friend, you're missing that foundation. You're missing a foundation that will inspire people, that will make people understand why they're there. And even more, you know, another question is, well, what are the stories that you currently have that are showing these values? What are mm -hmm. the stories that are happening in your business that are not? Mm -hmm. Um one of my clients in the telecommunications industry, what triggered it for them was that they had four companies really under this one name and they were bringing them all together and removing the silos. And so it was about, well, how now, <laughs> how now that makes me giggle every time. How at this point do we all come together because we've been operating differently, mm -hmm. but what do we do now? Mm -hmm. And how do we get all the leaders who are the owners of the business on that same page and committed to modeling these actions in their way, but still modeling them? And then how do they connect the departments? And are they letting people in the other, essentially, departments talking to one another mm. and having those cross-departmental conversations? And if not, well, that's a big trigger because there's this lack of clarity then, and things will be done inconsistently from one, from, uh, one silo to the next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanna get to, uh, to two more questions before, we, uh, before I make a few closing remarks. Erin um, was asking, uh, she appreciated the study that you cited about how people behave when they feel leaders respect them. Mm -hmm. um, and was just wondering if you could share that citation again. Yeah. Um, in your slide deck? In my, yeah, yeah. It was from uh, the energy, um, the energy product and brr, the energy project and mm -hmm. the Harvard Business, uh, Harvard Business Review. They did this study, I believe it was in 20, that's a face, 2018. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um so simply go online and Google it. Uh, if I can also send that uh, link through to Michael and perhaps we can put yeah, that in like I'll the YouTube link. Yeah, I'll, I'll include it as part of the, uh, um, just to digress for a sec, a number of people did ask if we'd be making the, the virtual gathering available. Yes, we will on our YouTube channel. Um, and what I'll also include in, in a follow-up is I'll include a link to the study uh, that Aaron was asking about. So awesome. that would yeah. be part of the follow-up email. Beautiful. Yeah. I will get on that. And Aaron, you will get access to that study. Awesome. And <laughs> final question. Eric had a number of questions for us, but I'm gonna I'm gonna take his last one. Um uh what evidence do you see that people in an organization actually want to change? Mm -hmm. They're tired, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. They're tired. They're frustrated. I mean, ultimately, they are not being heard. And so a lot of the times, the start of this process is often met with skepticism because they haven't been heard before. Mm -hmm. But when the leadership team gives that permission for them to share and there won't be any repercussion, that's when they start to have some buy-in to change and that commitment and they see okay well this is what we're doing and this is where we're going and you want to hear from me all right um again though some people won't some people will be so against it and that is an opportunity for them to self-select out and that's okay because 
what got you here will not get you there. And that includes with your people. And mm. it doesn't mean they're bad people. It means they're just not a right fit. And it means that um, if you're really wanting to take your business into the future in a specified way, you have to be so intentional about it and mm. your people have to be on board. And if people in that organization do not want to be on board, well, it, it's a hard conversation, but there are people out there who do. And when we consider, um, you know, generations, and of course it is across generations, but the new people who are entering the workforce, these things matter more and more and more. Yes. And so if a company isn't willing to have these conversations with their people about what can we do better? How can we change? What would you like to see us doing? It doesn't mean you have to do it. It means you're just being open to listening. And when you take that time to listen to what your people are wanting and experiencing and hopeful for, they are more likely to move forward with the change that you do implement. And if you give them an explanation as to why you've gone this way, it's headed that way, they will get on board or they'll self-select out. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, this has been incredibly informative, insightful, uh, actionable. Um, thank you both, Lindsay, for sharing your framework, Steph, and I loved your reflections. Thank you for coming on and sharing what your experience was in working with Lindsay. Um, for our attendees, thank you as well for joining us this morning. Um, I did put a survey link in the chat. Uh, if you could just take 30 seconds to answer that, that will help inform uh, some future programming from, uh, from our team. Um, and if you're new to Conscious Capitalism, uh, check out our website, learn about our movement at ConsciousCapitalism.org. Um, and if you're an executive uh, implementing conscious practices in your business, um, check out our Senior Leader Network. You can find some more information there as well on our website. Uh, we have some more virtual gatherings coming up in the month of April. You can check those out again on our website. Um, and again, thank you both so much for your time, your reflections, your thoughts, and your insights. Um, greatly, greatly appreciated. And, thank you uh, for having us. Yeah, you yeah. got it. Thank you. Yeah, have a great rest of the, uh, the day, the afternoon. Um, to our attendees and our guests, thank you again.